Um, I'm Miss Tiffany, and I'm an occupational therapist with Progressive Pediatric Therapy. And we are a therapy clinic here in Palm Beach County. We have a location in Boca, a location in Lake Worth, and a location in West Palm Beach. And we offer the trio. We offer OTPT and speech therapy services for kids. And um, we decided it might be kind of fun while all of us are home uh, with our kids to provide some education to everyone on how they can help their kids uh, with regulation, especially while we're all kind of trapped inside the house and it's hard to get outside. Um, we should all be trying to get outside when we can, but it's hard. And everybody seems to be sitting at a computer and learning that way. And um, things are different. Parents are trying to figure out how to help their kids. And so what I wanted to do was I wanted to, to talk about uh, regulation strategies that are associated with proprioception. So proprioception is a lesser known um, aspect of our sensory system. It is the system that consists of our soft tissue, our muscles, the fascia, and everything that happens in that extension of the muscles, fascia, tendons, ligaments into the bone at our joints. And it's really, really important and it's really, really special because it works in concert with all of our other sensory systems in order to help us figure out where we are in space, where we are in relation to objects. And it is one of our most organizing and regulating sensory systems. So it's all of that information, as I said, that comes in from our joints, all the spaces between our bones. And so it is so special because it works in concert with everyone else, but also because it has this organizing quality. So with proprioception, it can help wake up our bodies when our bodies are feeling really slow and sluggish, and it can help slow our bodies down when our bodies are feeling really fast and wiggly or, or emotionally fast and anxious. So what can we do proprioception, proprioception wise in order to help our bodies? So any of these activities can be utilized either to wake up your lazy kids that won't get up off the couch or to help slow down those kids that can't sit still, that can't attend to the computer while they're trying to do their lessons. So you want to think about, I like to use the idea of yoga, right? So much of what we do in yoga is bending at our waist, bending our knees, weight bearing on our upper body, right? So we're giving all of that input to our bodies. We're compressing all of these different joints within our system. And so yoga is super organizing, super regulating, and it helps to relax your body as you need it. But it can also help to invigorate your body, depending on how quickly you're moving. So the kinds of activities that you can be doing with your kids to help them proprioceptively is to do things like for younger kids, like those animal walks. You hear in therapy, we're always doing bear walks. We're always doing crab walks. So if you're having a fun little game of Simon Says, or, uh, you know, and let each other lead. Maybe everybody gets a chance to lead. This is when you can say, you know, Simon Says, let's bear walk around the room. And so everybody gets on all fours with their, you know, in that, that down dog V and bear walks, that bear creep. And then you could say, Simon Says, crab walk. So then everybody gets and goes into their, their supine position, pushed with their hips pushed up and walks like crabs. This is when you guys can be hopping like bunnies and kangaroos and providing that input um, to the body, all right? Another really fun proprioceptive technique is to, um, to push or pull. We call it heavy work. Heavy work is anything that is helping to provide that input through pushing or pulling, okay? Or carrying or lugging, putting something on your back. Super, super fun, easy activity that we can do with our kids that's heavy work is get a laundry basket, stick one of your kids in it, have one of your other kiddos push, push that kid around, pull that kid around in that, in that laundry basket, and then have them trade. And if you have a bigger kid and a box, 
you could easily cut open the box and create a, a something that you can pull and slide each other around on. Kids really have a great time doing things like that. All right. Um, I have a bunch of resources that I'm going to actually share to the progressive pediatric therapy uh, page that everyone can go check out later so they can go get their own ideas. Um, but heavy work is, is one of those things. Another really fun heavy work activity is to um, roll each other up in, um, I like to use a yoga mat or a big blanket where you roll them up tight. I call it a burrito. So I roll up my son inside the, the, my yoga mat and I give him a good, nice squeeze compression. Okay. So fun tasks to do, uh, gross motor tasks, anything that's going to involve, uh, jumping, pushing, weight bearing, right. And then our heavy work tasks are anything where you're actually pulling or lugging or pushing. Okay. And you guys can, you know, do fun activities with a big exercise ball where you're even just passing it around behind each other to each other, um, doing repetitive activities, anything repetitive, um, lifting it over your head, bending your knees, smooshing them with uh, having them lay down on the ground and rolling a big exercise ball onto their bodies. That's another really fun activity. So, um, those gross motor skill, those gross motor activities are all going to help you like get your kids moving. All right. Now, if you have some older kids, um, there's great <laughs> chores that you can have them do mopping, vacuuming, any of those kinds of things, carrying a heavy laundry basket, um, younger kids, um, those kinds of chores are also really great to, to provide that proprioceptive input. All right. So, we're talking now about like activities we can do to get our body to an appropriate state of arousal, right? Of being ready to engage and participate. All right. So when we're talking about actual sensory regulation and self-regulation, um, it's outside that realm of like, let's have fun and let's move our bodies. Um, not because it can't be presented that way, but because when we're talking about self-regulation, we're usually talking about the idea that our children need to learn how to handle their emotions or appropriately organize their body to participate and engage, all right? So self-regulation is not just, it, all, when you think about sensory processing, all of us, whether we have sensory processing disorder or we're you know, neurotypical people, we all use our sensory systems in order to get ourselves functioning and, and, and able to engage and participate. So think about sitting in a lecture or a class in a, and you're listening to a speaker and you're, it's just after lunch, you just came back to finish this class and you're starting to feel a little sluggish, you're starting to feel a little tired. You actually naturally do things to start waking yourself up. You stretch, you put your head backwards, you move around, you tap your leg, maybe some people chew on their pen. We get up, we get a drink of water. That is regulating your body in, a, in order to be able to engage, okay? You take a walk to the bathroom, you move around, you provide that input to stimulate yourself so you can sit and you can pay attention, all right? So when we're talking about that kind of regulation as it pertains to our kids, that's when you want to help them, especially in this distance learning situation, really be able to utilize techniques that can help them engage. So what are some things you can do with a child who is visibly getting sleepy, right? While they're sitting at, at trying to pay attention or while they're working on homework. And I do this in in the clinic, in my sessions with my kiddos, when I see them starting to yawn because we're doing a writing task. So I'm gonna show you guys my, my, my fun little go-to to wake up a child who needs to be woken up and more aroused in order to engage. And so I get them going by first tapping their head and then I have them tap their cheeks. And usually like I'll count to 10 in my own. So I'm like, ah, we're tapping our head, we're tapping our cheeks. 
we're crossing our body and touching both shoulders. So now I'm engaging both sides of my body and I'm crossing midline. Super, super stimulating to the brain. So we tap our shoulders and then we tap down our arms and we tap down our other arm and then we pat our belly. Like, let's see, can I make it so you guys can see? Then we pat our belly and we pat our thighs and then we stomp our feet and then I have them clap 10 times. And then I have them take their hands in front of their chest and I have them push their hands together really, 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 really hard and count to 10. And this is such a stimulating, wonderful thing to just wake up someone who needs to be woken up and re-engaged. All right, what do we do with those wiggly, wiggly kids? All right, so those wiggly, wiggly kids, they are the ones who need to be able to calm their bodies down. And proprioception is great for that because of its organizing qualities. So you can use similar techniques. Now you, I will sometimes just even do that when I see that a child is having a hard time sitting still because it's rhythmic, it's, it's predictable, and it's, I'm doing everything 10, 10 seconds, 10 seconds of it, and I'm pushing. So you can do something like that. Or you can use some more um, full body proprioceptive techniques. So anything that's going to give compression. So when the body feels fast and wiggly, if you want to have the kids give themselves a hug, right? So wrap both arms around themselves and then bend at the waist, maybe bend themselves into a ball and squeeze their whole body. Hold it for 10 seconds. Let them come out. All right. See how they feel. Try it again. All right. So it's really hard to expect our children to be able to do all these things by themselves. We can't just be like, go do your techniques. We have to be there. We have to help guide them through it because as we help them when they need it, they learn how to do it. And then as they get older, they know I can do my technique. So anything compression, when your child is wiggly, like I said, you want to get their knees up, get their, you want to give them all that compression. Okay. You can also do um, a technique that I really like called the finger pull. So the finger pull is when you take your hands and you put your palms together like this. So each one is sort of hovering. And then you cup your fingers in and you connect them to make like a link, all right? And then what you do is you pull really hard. So you pull really, really hard. You can have them sitting, you can have them standing. If you have them standing, you can have them bend and pull. So here I am giving myself a whole bunch of input, counting to 10, breathing, and then I release. Okay? Any kind of physical massaging, if you want to massage them or teach them to massage themselves, that also will help them calm down their bodies. They can massage their arms. All right. These techniques that I'm giving you, these can be used when they need to be engaged and they need to utilize techniques for arousal in order to engage. These techniques can also be used with kiddos who need help with emotional regulation, all right? Because our emotions are an experience that happens within our body. And when we experience certain types of emotions, we have visceral responses to those feelings that are coming. So let's take frustration. We've all felt frustrated, all right? We've all been irritated and frustrated and our, our bodies are moving a little bit faster, right? Our heart rate is a little bit up. We're on that edge of feeling like we might get really angry about something if we don't, you know, we're irritated. You can feel it in your belly. You can feel it in your gut. The experience of being frustrated, the experience of being anxious, the experience of being nervous, those are all those feelings that you feel inside your body. And they're, they're feelings that your heart rate speeds up and your breath, your respiratory rate also speeds up. So here we are moving really quick. Our bodies are moving really quick. And we need to utilize proprioception to help our bodies slow down. All right. So why do we want to slow our bodies down? And this is important even for children, like children who have differences in sensory processing are more prone to having behavior difficulties or meltdowns associated with sensory processing. 
but every single one of us can benefit from utilizing our sensory system in a productive way in order to help us learn how to be mindful and regulate, okay? So when we talk about kids who do have sensory processing disorder, sensory processing disorder. They are kiddos who are more susceptible to getting overstimulated and having something that looks like a tantrum. So when you have a 13 year old who has Asperger's and he has a hard time, he has, it goes into sensory overload and has a sensory meltdown. It's different than, you know, a two or three year old having a tantrum, okay? It is actually happening from an overstimulation of what's happening around them all of the input coming in from all of the sensory systems. So when a child is getting into the point of being overstimulated, and this can happen to any of us, it's not just kids with sensory processing disorder, kids who are just in a situation that's new and they don't know what to expect, or a situation where they feel nervous, maybe they have to speak in front of the class, right? And it's, it's a triggering experience. When we are going through an emotion that makes our, fat, our body feel fast, like nervousness or anxiety, where our, our, our senses actually expand because we're moving into that sort of buildup to fight or flight, right? Because it's a negative response to what's happening. We're taking in all this sensory input and we are utilizing it to try to figure out how to interact with our environment. All right. So when we are, anyone can become overstimulated, but children um, that, that do have sensory processing disorder are just more sensitive to different types of sensory input and also less responsive to other types. So they are, they of, often go through these things more than neurotypical kids, but neurotypical kids can go through sensory overstimulation as well. So what is sensory overstimulation? Sensory overstimulation is when all of the input is too much, okay? So we've all been in those situations. Maybe we've been at a party and there's too much going on and it's, a new, it's new people, you're meeting too many new people and it's overwhelming, all right? All of the smells, all of the sights are overwhelming. And so what ends up, what ends up happening is we have a physiological response. So when you have a child who is going through some sort of sensory overstimulation or sensory overload, they have physiological responses to what's going on. So what does that look like? What do I mean when I say physiological responses? Pupils dilate, palms get sweaty, mouths get dry. Um, they might start to feel, they might start to complain of an upset stomach. They might, might start to say that their tummy hurts or they feel nauseous. Okay, um, you might see restlessness or a, a, a hyperactivity or more activity. You might also see them start to shut down and try to avoid. Okay, so because all of our brains are different and all of our brains um, take in information and our sensory systems are totally tailored to us and our experiences, um, everyone might respond differently. So you need to, when you're looking at sensory overstimulation, you need to be looking at your child and seeing if there are any changes to them physiologically. So, like I said, I'm gonna go through those again. Are, am I seeing their pupils dilate? Are they getting sweaty? Is their mouth getting dry? Are they complaining of an upset stomach? All right, um, let's see. Uh, maybe they start breathing a little bit faster. You might see them get floppy. You might see them avoid. Um, you might see them starting to avoid eye contact, okay? Um, they might actually, when, with children who have a sensory processing disorder, often sounds bother them. They might start to cover their ears. They might start to squint or block their eyes. Things become a little bit too much for them to, to take. <clears throat> so what do we want to do in these times? This is when you want to use those strategies. You want to use those proprioceptive strategies. And like I said, here I am doing this live and I'm giving information. Um, I'm also gonna post some resources, maybe a couple of books that talk about these types of things. And um, also just some, some web pages, really great web pages that I've seen. So this is when you wanna get those fast and wiggly techniques. 
you want to, you can try to get them to do wall push-ups or chair push-ups. But I really think that this is the time when you want to, you want to tell them, place those hands in front of your heart. And let's, let's think about this. Okay. Let's push our hands together really tight. All right. Let's take breaths. Let's count to 10 really slowly and let's provide ourselves that input. You can get a rock in there because that also helps to regulate. All right. So we're utilizing proprioceptive receptive techniques to try to help calm our child's sensory system down. You definitely want to remove them from the situation. So if they're in a situation where it's very busy and they're starting to go into this overstim or this sensory meltdown, you want to kind of take them into a dark space or a quieter space. You want to make it make them feel safe. All right. And believe me, at a time when a child is is not doing what you want them to do and they're they're you know, maybe they're overstimmed and they're bouncing all over the place because they're overstimulated. We need to also be calm. And sometimes it's really hard. I'm a mom. I know. But this is when we need to be like, all right, I'm going to help you through this. And you want to take them away from the situation. You want to get them into a quiet, safe place. And you want to talk them through proprioceptive strategies, that finger pull, that body hug. You want to help them give them self-input in order to help their bodies calm down. All right. Um, sensory, a sensory meltdown or like going into a sensory meltdown is actually the body going into fight or flight. Okay. So when a child goes over that overstimulation and goes into a meltdown, it is very, very difficult to get them out of that place. All right. You definitely want to make sure that you take them to a safe place, maybe a dark place, maybe a place where there's a bean bag or something soft or comfortable that can help protect their body. You know your child. If you have a child that goes into a sensory meltdown and they start destroying things or they start, you need to you need to get them to a safe place where they can calm their body down because they are now in a fight or flight. Their body is, is either fighting or fleeing. So you need to know your child and you need to help them into a safe place where they can calm down. All right. What is the difference between behavior and a behavior tantrum and a sensory, a sensory meltdown? The difference is that um, sensory meltdown has physiological changes, the sweating, the pupil dilation, these physical experiences that continue even after the, the child has calmed down. And you will see these responses hang around for about 20 to 30 minutes until the child's body returns to a normal state. Okay. Behavior, which is another component of all this because there's sensory that affects our behavior, but then there's also just, I don't want to do something, right? There's the behavior. So when a child is actually utilizing um, manipulative techniques or crying or having a tantrum because they want to get out of something, typically once you remove them, remove the stressor that's causing that behavior, they go back to normal and will engage normally. So the difference between that behavior meltdown and that sensory meltdown is that um, the children who have a sensory meltdown actually have physiological changes that remain after. And a child with a behavior meltdown will typically go back and engage normally very, right away. Um, I haven't seen any comments or anything coming up or questions or anything. So I don't know if anyone has any questions. They're not showing up. But um, I will post some uh, different resources for everyone. So please check back at the Progressive Pediatric Therapy Facebook page um, for some updates to this uh, live talk. And I wanted to ask everyone to come back tonight at 7 p.m. for our live bedtime story reading, um, where you'll get to see one of our awesome OT, PTs, or speeches um, reading a bedtime story. Um, I know we're also going to do some in Spanish. So if there's um, any Spanish families that want to tune in for a bedtime story from one of our bilingual therapists, um, we're doing our first one tonight at 7 p.m. So see you then. And I also wanted to say, um, please leave a comment if there's any um, other topics you want us to do Facebook Lives about, because we're going to try to rotate um, our awesome therapists to provide different information, because we all have different skills that we can help our communities with. 
So please uh, leave in the comments any uh, ideas that you want for later lives. And thanks for tuning in. And I hope you guys learned something. And see you soon.